News on Rainier Avenue Radio. Pass.com reports that a new phone scam is making it the rounds in King County, where callers claim to be from the prosecutor's office and demand money over made-up crimes. In one of the calls, the scammer identified themselves as King County Prosecuting Attorney Dan Satterberg and asked for $890 to be wired via MoneyGram in exchange for dropping non-existent charges related to contracting underage persons. The call used a spoofed number appearing to be legitimate for the prosecutor's office at 206-977-1200. Prosecutor said anyone charged legitimately with a crime will be notified via a formal summons or a warrant, which both require handling in person. If you received a suspected scam call, don't panic. Write down any information you can gather about the call. Contact your local law enforcement to report the attempted fraud. The non-emergency number for the Seattle Police Department is 206-625-5011 or make a report online. And four, if the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office has actually charged you with a crime separate from these scam calls, notify your attorney. What's on your heart? Are you exhausted at the lack of progress for people of color in business, politics, and life? This is Cindy Bright, the host of Heartbeat Radio. Each week, we explore this heart condition of the country that is affecting you and me. We have real conversations about what's necessary for change. It's time to change this dialogue. Will you join this Heartbeat Weekly Wednesdays at 7 p.m. on Rainier Avenue Radio? This is your Rainier Avenue Radio dot world community update on online Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. If you're looking for an AA meeting, find one every day online at aaphonemeetings.org. That's meetings.org. You can protect others from getting sick from COVID-19. Do. Stay at home unless you need food, medicine, or medical care. Avoid large crowds. And if you have to go out, stay at least six feet away from other people. Don't forget to wear a cloth face covering so you don't spread germs when you talk, sneeze, or cough. Cloth coverings should not, however, be used on children under two. For more information, call 206-477-3977. That's 206-477-3977. Atlantic Street Center has been serving the children, youth, and families of the Seattle King County area since 1910. We partner with families and communities to raise healthy, successful children and youth through services including counseling, early learning, youth development, domestic violence, and education support for school-age children. Committed to serving the African-American community, Atlantic Street Center provides services and support for all marginalized people. Learn more at AtlanticStreetCenter.org. Hey, Buford, why are you kicking that old CD player? Because I can't hear the radio. Can't hear the radio? Let me help you. Hey, 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 you two. Quit beating up that outdated audio equipment. You can't hear the radio on a CD player. You can. No, no, you can't, you adorable simpletons. But you can hear some great radio on the Rainier Avenue radio app. It's brand new, it's free, and it's available for Android and iPhone. In fact, you can download the Rainier Avenue radio app right now from the Google Play Store or the iPhone app store i'm gonna go give me a smartphone right now i'm just gonna put a graduation cap on my rotary phone (laughs) you two have very significant personal issues get the rainier avenue radio dot world app today this is rainier avenue radio dot world Welcome to Rainier Avenue Radio Dot World. It's me, Tony B, and this uh, is Friday, 2021, our first show of the year. Uh, if you have not tuned in before and you don't know what's going on right now, we're going to be telling you everything that you need to know about the coronavirus um, until this stops. If you tuned in with us on March 13th when we started this for the first time, Uh, You were probably, like me and a lot of other people, um, not thinking we would be here at this place in 2021 that we are now, worse than we were when we started in March. 
So this is how we come into 2021. Uh, the coronavirus is still a big problem. People are dying. Um, that's what they said would happen. Uh, those who were already experiencing trauma got the worst of this thing and will continue to get the worst of it. Believe it or not, initially there were a lot of different uh, thoughts on that. And, you know, there was this conversation, we're all in this together. And I understand the rallying point about that. But if you know that you are part of the group that has already caught hell, you catch it in health disparities, you catch it in uh, equity and justice, then you know this is going to impact you. The problem was other people had to be convinced that it had to happen and our communities needed to know what was going on because we were in isolation it's important to know that you're not alone and so we started doing these shows and we've been doing them ever since if you want to go back uh to our website and see the archive you can start from show one and you'll just kind of have a chronological back a chronological review of how this thing progressed as we talked to a number of different folks from scientists uh health professionals communities, small businesses, business associations, educators, COVID positive folks, um, everybody. And then we reached out uh, beyond South Seattle because folks were like, hey, you know, you have a very diverse population listening to this and we're starting to hear things that I think should be in our community, but I'm not hearing about it. So we reached out, you know, to well, pretty much everywhere around the state of Washington. Bremerton and uh, Everett and Spokane and Clark County, Vancouver, Washington. We, you know, and found out that folks, again, were all in the same boat. Some things that we found out before they became attention, like what was happening uh, in black communities, what was happening in Pacific Islander communities, what was happening and the other stressors that were taking place that were associated with this coronavirus pandemic that we are now in. Um, we're gonna be having a conversation, of course, about the coronavirus. Now there's this thing, uh, a vaccine that has come and it's here. How's it being distributed? I know there's gonna be a ton, ton of questions. Believe me, we're gonna be uh, providing you with the information so that you can make a decision for yourself. You know how we get down. We don't tell you what to think, but we certainly present you with a number of different viewpoints so that you can discern and decide for yourself to make the best uh, decision for you. Uh, a little later in the show, King County Council Chair Claudia Balducci will be coming on to talk about um, the money from Amazon, $2 billion for housing uh, in East King County. We'll talk about that. Uh, also joining us uh, will be uh, Seattle Department of Transportation. We're talk going to talk about some of the things associated uh, with transportation and how the coronavirus has impacted that, how they do business. And we're also specifically, because we do, going to tell you about South Seattle. We're going to tell you about the um, uh, the projects going on in there that may divert traffic and uh, how what SDOT, Seattle Department of Transportation, is doing about that. And then also, you know, the scooters and stuff like that. We're going to, of course, zone in on South Seattle because that's what we do. But we know there's a bigger picture to this. Uh, joining me will be Carmen Pacheco-Jones. Um, and uh, yeah, initially, I think that I was going to talk to Carmen specifically, you know, about uh, the coronavirus and the work that she does. But uh, they, uh, Carmen has uh, put together a phenomenal, uh, if you missed it, you can go check it out, it's called Dismantling Racism, a three-series show that we were airing every um, Thursday at 10 o'clock here. And if you missed it, you need to go check it out. And so uh, with the things that have happened recently, I don't know what I'm going to talk to Carmen about. We just might talk about how everything uh, and just give you some background on what she does so that you know who she is. Um, so that'll be coming up. But right now, uh, if you uh, are a renter, which a lot of people are, as a matter of fact, more than homeowners, there's a lot of stuff that's been going on. The property is tight. We, we talk about homeless issues. There's, if you're a renter, uh, then you should be aware of, and you're probably aware of, if you're not, uh, there is a tenant union. And uh, joining me on the program is Violette 
La Latte, Executive Director for the Washington State Tennis Junior. Did I say your last name correctly? You actually did. Thank you. Um, Lavatai. So Lavatai. Lavatai. <laughs> well, thank you uh, for joining us. I want to give you, uh, give folks a little background information on you, are because uh, and this is just coincidence. You know, uh, Violet, I tell people about the amazing things that go on in South Seattle and the amazing people that come from South Seattle. And you know as well as I do, we just have open arm conversation. And a lot of people, when they think about South Seattle, they think of crime. They think of, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> And, and that's why we exist as a radio station is to amplify the voices. And so coincidentally, the executive director of the Washington Tenants Union grew up in Southeast Seattle. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tony. <laughs> and for uh, more than 30 years, and today uh, you still call it your home and your community. Uh, you've volunteered and, uh, and gotten been involved in grassroots organizations and advocated for better jobs and homes and food and transportation for low-income people of color. And um, you went to school to further your education in accounting and administration and um, uh, on a trip back to Washington, D.C., take back the capital where the government was cutting unemployment for the many Americans who had lost their jobs during the recession. The, it, it, if people don't know, now they really know how vital the work you do is and how vital the people who do this type of work is. And so uh, if you're a tenant, when this pandemic hit and you lost your job or your income wasn't coming in, you 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 know <laughs> how important it was. So I want to start out, Violet, by by giving some information about the Washington about the tenants union. Um, first, let's start with this because everybody may not know. You know, and some yeah. people. Uh, what what is the tenants union, and maybe a little history about why it was started, and and just some background information like that. Yeah, the tenants union actually started. Thank you, Tony, for having me on today. Um, the Tenants Union started actually in 1977. It was a group of tenants who got together that were fighting against slumlords, actually. And so the work of the Tenants Union, what we do is we're tenant advocates. And um, we help tenants in um, their tenants' rights to make sure that, you know, there's rules and regulations um, in our tenancy. And sometimes the landlords, you know, um, they don't go by those rules. And that's why we exist. We educate tenants on their tenant rights and renters' rights. And we also push for legislation for um, better RCWs and laws. Um, years ago, laws that were oh, for oh, tenants. I, 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 I got to interrupt you because I don't understand everything and everybody doesn't either. So RCW, what do you mean? Oh, sorry. sorry. RCWs are laws like, um, you know, um, RCWs are what the, the numbers are be behind the, the laws when it comes to renters' right. Mm -hmm. And so if you get a RCWs for, you know, um, repair, refix, um, you got to look it up in your um, legislation, in your laws and things like that. And that's what we, where we come in. Right. We come in and um, advocate tenants of their rights. We also try to stop evictions. Um, there are illegal evictions, and what we do as an organization is we educate um, on our hotline. We have a hotline and uh, workshops all over the state of Washington. And so what we do is we educate and share with the tenants their rights. A lot of, a lot of tenants, I can tell you, Tony, a lot of them do not know what their rights are. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's why we exist. We not only push for legislation to change, you know, there's a lot of um, changes that we have helped support um, in legislation to protect tenants as renters. Uh -oh, hold on a second. Let me mention my technology. You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, again, my uh, guess is Violet Lavatai. Did I get it right? I'm going to get it. I'm sorry. Did you I actually it? got it right. You actually said my name in Samoan. <laughs> well, you're good, Tony. <laughs> well, hey, you know, when you grew up in South Seattle, you know, you want to address people the way because you're used to that. You know, you right? just, want, you want to just take it for granted. Somebody's name is their name. You know? <laughs> I know that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um uh, but so anyway, we're talking about the tenants. Thank you for that uh, background information. Um, 
uh, I, I'm going to ask you just a couple of, of, of really, you know, maybe maybe they may seem like basic questions to you, uh, but to other people, um, they may not be. And yeah. so, you know, just as as an is how do you report a landlord in in Washington State? How how do you do that? How does that work? You know, because you know, like you said, a lot of people don't know, and then you throw in that intimidation factor, and you know, all the other stuff that's for really, really, really going on. You know what I mean? That's who yeah. needs a union. You know, how how do you uh, report a landlord in Washington State? Well, right now, um, because we'll get into the moratorium, there's um, um, organizations that are set up for like fair housing, mm -hmm. Office of Civil Rights also. Um, and so King County has their Office of Civil Rights. What they what we do is when they get complaints, you know, we're, we're an organization that um, gets things done. Sometimes we have to protest, Tony. And that's the thing about going after these landlords. Um, in 2016, there was a law passed because, you know, landlords gave 43 people of color, um, majority of them were black, um, and rented and was going and said, we don't, you know, we don't want to uh, rent to you anywhere because you have section eight vouchers. Mm -hmm. And so you can see that the discrimination still exists, even in housing. And so what we do is we come alongside of the tenants and we uplift the tenants and we try to change laws. And that's how we get things done because we're not, um, it's not going to change if we don't take action. And when we're talking about, um, people always ask me, why is there a homeless problem? And I always tell them it's racial and discrimination behavior that has been set up um, in our system, even in housing. Uh, Violet, when the pandemic happened, what what were the thoughts that were going through your mind? Obviously, based off of what you do, you were, you know, this was going to impact what you do. So I'm taking it back now, March 13th. Uh, you know, when we did our first show, I think March 7th is when the governor started to say, "Hey, hey, hey, we're going to shut shut this down." Um, what, what, what was going on with you at that time? What were you thinking you, as far as a tenant union you needed to do? Well, I needed to, you know, um, when COVID hit, they said, we're going to close down a lot of things. We had to close down our clinics also. Um, we didn't close our hotline. Um, and so my thought was, how do we still help tenants even through the COVID? And what we did was because we couldn't meet at the office, even um, with the governor's order to shut down everything, um, close offices. And we we have a small office. It's actually right here on Rainier Avenue. Mm -hmm. And so we had to close the office, but we knew that we couldn't close off the tenant union. And so we had to really get the hotline out to where we, you know, all of our hotline, all of our staff has the hotline with them 24 seven. Mm -hmm. And I'm not kidding you. We found ways to get the hotline, redo everything. Um, even though we had to under the governor's moratorium order is to shut down our clinics. You know, nobody was meeting. Um, and so the hotline is still in existence. We've come up with creative ways to help tenants still. We have amazing state of, um, um, state lawyers who help low income tenants who can afford legal um, services. And so we work hand in hand with different organizations that come alongside of us. And really the people who are experiencing the worst of the worst is people who have lost their jobs, have no way, you know, have waited for their unemployment for, for weeks. And we know that the landlord still has to pay his mortgage and everything. So we were getting calls on, when does the moratorium, I mean, we really had to um, really ask the governor to look at the people who can't pay their rent. If the moratorium was not in place, Tony, there will be hundreds upon thousands of people on the streets right now. Yeah. My guest again is Violet Lavatai, executive director for the World.
Tenants Union or Tenants Union of Washington. Uh, we're talking about the Tenants Union, who they who they are, uh, what they do. We've heard a little bit of history. Um, uh, I want to get into now because you started moving in that direction. Uh, but I, I just you were an essential business. People probably didn't think about that, you know. But the, the immediately, people who needed help were going to be coming to you, uh, and you couldn't shut down, and everybody had to shut down, you know. Yeah. Uh, so just wanted to get that out there. Thank you for sharing. So I want to talk now, uh, cause you got to look to the, uh, uh, the moratorium. Um, how were you engaged or were you engaged at that process? You know, because you're a frontline person. Um, uh, it, it, did you work with the governor? Did the governor work with you? And I'm just saying, keep it real. You know what I mean? I, yeah. How did that work? So there's advocates all over the state of Washington, and we had to come together, write letters to the governor, meet with the governor's staff, really, really delve into how are we going to talk to the governor about this. It's not just our organization that is leading the way. There are many, Tony, um, organizations who have written to the governor. He knew the importance of not only did people lose their jobs, there was no way, and, and unemployment was stuck in a way where people weren't even getting their money. Nothing was coming in. So we had to just, you know, governor, and he's done a great job of doing that, listening to the people. He also is getting pressure from the other side. Mm -hmm. I get it. Landlords think that we're just not going to pay the rent, but we're asking the governor to also, you know, um, finding funding to help the tenant and the landlord. We're in a really bad state right now with our what our country is going through right now. And if we're not working together with the governor of our state, you will see mass evictions come to fruition. Uh, December 31st at midnight, this um, 2020, the governor's orders would have um, expired. But through advocacy and people just really talking with the governor, we have a good governor. And so he extended it to March 2021. So we've got until March 2021. Hopefully um, we get out of this recession and people get their jobs. But, you know, COVID right now is huge. I mean, we got all these things against us right now. And so we're trying to navigate where you won't see more people on the streets. You won't see families in, you know, living in their cars. And that's what the tenant union has done to come alongside a lot of or great organizations to get help to people. There are actually, I can tell you, Tilly, there are actually bad characters out there, landlords, who still try to evict the tenants. You know, um, where are they going to go? And so that's our job to help them navigate through those things that are happening with um, eviction process. We have amazing organizations like um, lawyers who help in the state, Housing Justice Project, Northwest Justice Project. You know, you have all these um, organizations who come along with, for people who are low income. And you know, a lot of the, 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 the people who are low income of our, is our most vulnerable senior citizens and things like that so um again, a lot tony this is violette latavai executive director for the tenant union of washington now i want to stay on this subject of the eviction and moratorium yes. um not not everybody you know and again it, it's people who are relying on that rent to pay their mortgage to pay the banker you know uh, this is a domino effect, and, and uh, I'm just giving a big picture of it here. You know what I'm yes. saying? Um, they don't have money, and they're getting asked for money. Um, so th this this domino effect that that takes place, and you have you and you're taking care of what you need to take care of. You know what I mean? Which is people who are it's a disaster to have pe hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people out on the street. You know, um, but what is, you know, for, for what, how will that work? You know what I mean? Yes. Because you, you brought it up. There are people who haven't gotten their rent for months. How's that going to work when the moratorium is over? And I think a lot of people are concerned about that, you know, that, yes. yeah. Yeah, totally, Tony. I, I um, um, and, and that's why I'm glad I came on your show because 
United Way and other funding that has gotten to United Way to help tenants pay their rent. Unfortunately, there's not enough funding to help, you know, help all the tenants. And that's why we're waiting for um, elected officials, government to um, find the funding to help the, the landlords too. Our stance is, you know, the landlords are saying, well, you're trying to get over on us. We're trying to pay our bills too. And that's the thing about um, getting some of this funding, asking the governor to find funding to help pay the rent because the landlords also have a mortgage. It's not, it's something that's so awful right now with the COVID, with people losing their jobs. It's just like a culmination of we're not just going through a bad recession. We're going through a horrible recession. And so I think that's the thing is finding funding to help the tenant and the landlord. And there was um, funding that came out. United Way was overwhelmed with calls of rental assistance. And that's what we want to do is have there's a, there's um, a funding that, sh that, that we're hoping that will come out that the landlord can get from this a pot of funding to help pay the mortgages and stuff like that. So right now, I'm just going to ask you point blank. Can a landlord evict you? Can a landlord kick you out? No, absolutely not. Under this, the, the moratorium of the governor, March 2021, you cannot, until the moratorium lifts, then they can um, put notices or rent increase, um, things like that. But the moratorium protects the tenants from getting those eviction notices or um, rent increases or any kind of notice. And so you cannot get evicted under the moratorium. Now, Seattle is also, they actually um, had a moratorium before the governor came out with a statewide one, and Seattle was um, March 2021. They, they, the mayor had put in March 2021 before the governor did statewide. Now, uh, again, I'm just bringing this up. If you're a landlord and whatever is going on in your house on your property, you cannot evict them. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. All right. Uh, my guest again uh, is the Washington State Tennis Union. Again, I'm so glad that we had the opportunity to have this conversation with you. And, um, and uh, Violette, and, and find out more. Uh, we have just a couple minutes left. And um, I just want to give you this space here rather than me ask you some questions uh, <laughs> for you to communicate your message that you want to share with people right now. Go ahead. I think right now, you know, with, with, with everything going on in the world, there's people, there's people in losing their, you know, housing, losing their housing is in fear, is a fear that tenants across our nation is experiencing. What I want to say is I think that, um, hope, you know, it's a, I'm a hopeful person, Tony. And I think one of the things is hope is not going to pay the rent. I, I absolutely agree with that. But the thing is right now we're going to try to do, I think everybody working together and trying to look out for their neighbors and things like that. What I want to leave is looking out for your neighbors with each other. And I'm not going against the landlord, including the landlords. I think we're all in this together and I think at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is just get through each day, help navigate what we're going through with, you know, stay safe, mask up. Um, you know, I'm a firm believer that you will stop this virus if you take precautions. All right. And for folks who want to get in touch with you, um, how can they do that? You can call our free hotline on our website. Um, we get a lot of <laughs> traffic on our website. When you Google us, Tenants Rights, it comes right up. <laughs> so we do, we, um, there's a free hotline that's right there. You can call us um, Monday through Friday. We're, uh, we have a lot of advocates who will help you navigate. Um, we're not open on their clinics. And so, um, yeah. All right. Uh, we're going to go to break uh, here again. Um, uh, again, give that information one more again, please, Villa. All right. Um, www.tenantunion.org on our website. And our free hotline number is 
800-800-0500. All right. And so we know that these things cause stress. And um, uh, it, mental health is important at this time. And yes. you deserve to be heard and understood. And and uh, as you said, saying, uh, you know, that it is hard to navigate this world is an understatement right now. Yes. <laughs> um, Council member Zahi Lai and the National Alliance on Mental Illness are hosting a live town hall with panelists from King County and um, uh, specifically about uh, and black mental health experts to learn about resources, ask questions and have your voice be heard. You know how we get down on Rainier Avenue Radio. Uh, you can watch on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch. You can listen uh, on our audio streaming. Just plug into our download our app. Uh, go right to the website, have your voice be heard. That's this Thursday, the 14th, January 14th from 6 to 7.30. Uh, so you got a lot of things to think about. If you're listening to this and you're, you're saying, okay, man, it was good to hear about this tenants union. But uh, it, you know what? Mental health is a real thing. Call in and, and share some information. Here's some information. Find out some information. Um, we'll be back right after this. This is Paul Pearson, host of Star Time. And when I'm not explaining to my intern exactly what R&B is, I'm listening to Rainier Avenue Radio dot world. This is the news on Rainier Avenue Radio. A coronavirus outbreak at a Costco in Yakima County has infected 145 employees. Per Como News, health officials say the rapid increase in cases at the store is similar to a quote unquote quote, super spreader event in which multiple people are infected at the same time. All 145 employees have, that have tested positive are in isolation or quarantine, but the store itself remains open. The store employs a total of 383 people. Yakima County public health officials say the number of COVID-19 cases at the store shot up quickly from 68 on Thursday to 145 by Monday. And officials said the number of infections could go even higher. And that's your news on Rainier Avenue Radio. This is your Rainier Avenue Radio dot world community update on Seattle City Lights Utility Discount Program application. If you are impacted by COVID-19, otherwise known as the coronavirus, access the utility discount application online at seattle.gov slash UDP for utility discount program or call 206-684-3000. That's seattle.gov slash UDP or 206-684-3000. Tune in to Real Estate and Money every Tuesday afternoon from 2.30 to 3 here on Rainier Avenue Radio.world. Join your hosts, Violetta Strash with John L. Scott Kent North, Elsie Shadon with Keller Williams Mountain to Sound at the LC Legacy Group, and Tina Lombard with Cardinal Financial. They'll help you navigate the waters of our volatile real estate market and offer you some guidance on how to make your hard-earned money work to make your dreams come true. Learn about current trends, get tips on financial matters, and have fun, interactive discussions about your home inside and out. That's Real Estate and money. Atlantic Street Center has been serving the children, youth, and families of the Seattle King County area since 1910. We partner with families and communities to raise healthy, successful children and youth through services including counseling, early learning, youth development, domestic violence, and education support for school-age children. Committed to serving the African-American community, Atlantic Street Center provides services and support for all marginalized people. Learn more at AtlanticStreetCenter.org. You're listening to Rainier Avenue Radio dot world. Welcome back to Rainier Avenue Radio dot world, our special broadcast of the impacts of the coronavirus on South Seattle and surrounding communities. If you're just joining us. Uh, we just spoke with Philette Latvai, uh, Washington State Senate Union Director. Um, you'll be able to go back and and listen to that i think you really should whether you're a, a tenant a landlord or just someone else you know it's good information to know about the people who are living in your community living in your neighborhood uh you never know when you might be able to give somebody a hand uh if you're old school like me then you're thinking lean on me that's a whole nother thing i'm not getting into that right now um uh, coming up i'll be caught talking to carmen pacheco jones again uh, a little later on in the show, we'll be talking to King County Council Member Claudia Baducci talking about the recently awarded $2 billion for housing in King County. We'll talk about that. We'll also be talking to the Seattle uh, Department of Transportation and the challenges that they have faced during the pandemic. 
and um, how that impacts you. We're going to talk about some of the things that they're going to be doing, and we're going to hyper-focus and zoom in on um, uh, traffic provisions or things that are happening in regards to construction in South Seattle. That's who we are, Rainier Avenue Radio. So uh, we always make sure that we uh, take care of the folks in our community with information um, specific to our community. Ain't no shame in that. That's what we do. But we also uh, recognize responsibility with the first community that we live in, that the things that we are experiencing because of the diversity in our community, we are seeing a lot of things that folks in other communities are probably seeing. And uh, we try to be a voice for all of those. Uh, and that's one reason I'm, uh, I've connected with my guest, Carmen Pacheco Jones. Uh, before I bring Carmen on, I want to remind everybody uh, that uh, Sunday the 17th, and Sunday the 18th, we will be broadcasting live the 39th annual Seattle MLK Junior uh, Day celebration. 39, one of the oldest and largest in the country. On the 39th, uh, there will be a special broadcast, uh, a film that was created by the um, youth uh, component of the uh, MLK Junior Day celebration. Uh, you want to check that out. That'll be from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock. There'll be interviews. And then on the 18th, uh, the Davies holiday is celebrated. We will be broadcasting live from the rally, which will be outside. Uh, and, folks, there's some social distance things. You, normally what you have at this event is a ton of people packed into the Garfield uh, gymnasium. And it's a beautiful, amazing, wonderful thing. And, and so much... Uh, you, it's going to be outside this year, and you're going to have to social distance. If you can't make it, we'll be broadcasting, as we do every year, live, the, the event, uh, the rally. You can catch it on Rainier Avenue Radio across all of our platforms. And then also, um, we'll be uh, doing the rally, or the march as well. So you can also follow along with the march. We've done that before. Um, yeah. So, um, uh, joining me on the show... Uh, again, is Carmen uh, Pacheco Jones. Carmen, how are you? Um, hi, Tony. I am doing okay. Thank you so much for asking. I hope you are well as well. Well, you know, under the circumstances, I'm fantastic. I put that caveat under the circumstances. I'm going to give a little bit about your background. You are African American Health Initiative Specialist, former mental health promotion and suicide prevention coordinator with Washington State University, state certified trainer in diversity and social cognition, certified forensic peer counselor, community health worker, Whitworth graduate and master's candidate in education uh, with Gonzaga University. First of all, congratulations on all that. that Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> um, amazing hard work and perseverance. I was mentioning to folks that we had connected. Uh, you were someone who was recommended to me when I was uh, discussing how do I find out about what's going on in a community uh, in the pan during the pandemic. Yes. And uh, we have since connected. <laughs> yes. Yes, <laughs> and, we have. Uh, uh, when I was initially going to have you on the show, my thought was, uh, to talk about, you know, some of the work that you do and you've done within the pandemic. And um, actually, you you know, pulled together a group of folks with the Department of Health uh, and invited a number of folks across the state uh, uh, on a vaccine engagement effort. And um, so I said, OK, wow, we got a lot to talk to. We got a lot to talk about in our pandemic. And then um, Wednesday happened. <laughs> yes. And uh, again, all of these things are connected. All of this is happening in the middle of a pandemic. True. Um, and so there might be some other things that we talk about, mm -hmm. uh, because ultimately, at the end of the day, um, these are the things uh, that have now shown that you can't just keep putting a finger in the dike. Something has to be done about it. There are too many places where the safety net is leaking and we're under duress. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, let, let, that safety talk. net has uh, has collapsed and and has been collapsed for many years, and I think that we're just now really seeing the effects of it. Yeah. So uh, I guess the way I want to, I'll start. I'll start off like this, Carmen. Um, uh, the work that you're doing through connecting people um, in regards to vaccine engagement. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll just start with that, just to get us into the conversation thing. Uh, um, let's talk about that and, and why you are doing that and why that was important 
for you to do. Yeah, thank you so much. And so, you know, and I think it's important to understand the perspective that I come from. You know, I am an individual who has um, extremed, uh, experienced uh, um, extreme oppression, um, not only because of my race, but um, I'm a formerly incarcerated individual. You know, I'm a woman, um, you know, I, uh, I'm a woman who experienced poverty and navigated the child welfare system. And so, it became so important to me to use my voice to help others that are currently navigating those systems. And when I became aware of systemic um, or structural racism that, are, that is pervasive within every single system that you can imagine, our educational system, our healthcare system, um, you know, our justice system, it, it even further activated um, my resolve to um, ensure that voices were um, showing up and representing the communities that were being much uh, uh, disp disproportionately harmed by um, these systems. Um, and when, uh, shortly after the onset of COVID, I was working with um, several communities across the state um, that represent uh, disability rights um, because the state had put out a, um, crisis standards of care. Um, and on it, within that crisis standards of care, um, there was a devaluing of the life and experience of those living with disability. Um, and a lot of those people are, you know, people of color, people living in poverty, um, you know, people who have otherwise, um, you know, been subject to, um, you know, lack of access to healthcare. Um, and those all exposed inequities, right? Um, the inequity of, uh, you know, how through, you know, a, um, a country that is um, certainly, as we've seen Wednesday, um, predominantly um, serving, um, you know, affluent whites, um, you know, and, and wanting to address the pervasiveness of white supremacy, um, you know, I engaged with these conversations with Department of Health, um, and, and, and they struggle, struggle to absorb this concept, like how do we um, prioritize the health care of those who are most harmed? Um, but what we weren't looking at was the intersection between race and ethnicity and um, disability, um, knowing that we are further harmed by these systems and aren't afforded the care um, or, um, you know, even access to care. We saw that early on when, you know, our, our people couldn't get tested. You know, everybody across the country was getting tested, but, you know, black people, brown people, uh, you know, non-English speakers, indigenous, you know, uh, people with disabilities were being turned away from um, training or testing centers. And, um, yeah, and, I, and I want you to continue. But again, you can go back to one of these episodes, Carmen, and you say that. And sometimes people, things go by people in our community with the testing site. They were telling our community members to lie in order to take the test because of the barriers that were put in place Absolutely. that were preventing people from winning. So they were saying, oh, just lie, which was unacceptable. But I just wanted to, you know, because you're saying a lot of things right now. And there's so many of them, like you said, that safety net wasn't there already. And mm -hmm. it left. But now go back because I'm enjoying giving people the opportunity to hear about you and what you do and how you um, absolutely world. Thank you, Tony. Um, what we saw was, you know, every community out there effectively engaging and and um, uh, you know advocating for their community, but nobody was speaking for the BIPOC community, right? And so I asked, you know, where is that intersection? Where do we get heard, right? Where do we get the audience of the Department of Health? And um, a representative, one of the equity specialists, you know, reached out to me a couple of weeks ago and said, you know, hey, I want to, you know, I want to meet with you. You know, I want to discuss how can we get more, you know, uh, uh, communities of color voice in this, um, you know, how we are um, not only um, distributing the vaccine, but how it intersects with, um, you know, the disability community who are also on the lower ring of um, the distribution. Um, and, you know, I said, well, why just talk to me? Let me put together a group of people and we'll all meet with you, you know, because I'm never going to silo out work. You know, part of my um, 
uh, approach as an organizer and an activist is to bring other people in, in the door. If I have my foot in the door, and we should all be listening to this, right? If you have your foot in the door, if somebody's invited you in, bring in your brothers and sisters, you know, that that is critical. And oftentimes we don't understand that language. You know, we say, oh, you know, this is an opportunity for me or us, or I'm going to speak for the collective. I'm going to speak, you know, but that doesn't work, you know, because what comes in then is lateral oppression and proximity to whiteness presumed as power, you know. Um, so we all need to have that lens of inclusivity within our own communities. Um, and so you were one of the individuals that I immediately thought of because you have this platform and you have the ability to reach, you know, far greater numbers than I do. And, um, you know, out of, I think the 50 people that I contacted across the state, 30 responded. And I think about 24 or 26 showed up for the meeting. Um, you know, we were able to engage in a very, um, uh, active uh, conversation with Department of Health. And, um, you know, it, what was good is that, you know, they allowed us to lead the meeting, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't say, this is our agenda, we're going to feed this to you, accept it or not, <laughs> you know, but we were able to engage and, and, and also, um, you know, call out the need uh, for these voices to be able to be um, actively making the decisions and guiding what we need. Because I think we've said this multiple times, right? Those of us that are closest to the problem, and while race is not a problem, it is certainly deemed as one throughout these systems, right? You know, they look at us and they, they criminalize black and brownness. So they otherize black and brownness. So we then look at, you know, how can we effectively be heard, guide, reform, and make that change for our community. And that's what we did. You know, we have a follow-up meeting coming um, both Monday, um, where we will be uh, meeting with the disability community and openly, um, you know, collaborating. Um, and then also on Tuesday as well. All right. Uh, yeah, and then this the disability, and then on Tuesday as well. And, and again, this was a group of people that you pulled together. And one of the amazing things that you know, sometimes meetings happen, and, and it just, but there was a sense uh, of of not only urgency but understanding uh, that we need to do something about this. And Absolutely. so when you pulled all these people together, and then there was a presentation and the cooperation of the Department of Health. Uh, yes. you know, as well. I won't say anybody's name because I don't want their name mentioned, but there were people who cooperated. You know, they have government jobs, so I'm not going to, but it was a good thing, and that was my experience as well. My <laughs> initial experience with them was, hey, you know, you got to play fair. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, if you want to play, we can't just play. You got to play fair. Uh, mm -hmm. So I had previous, but, but then when you um, uh, called me in on that conversation and I heard, why don't you mention, if you can, the names of some of the people throughout the state or organizations or entities that you engaged in this conversation about. At the end of the day, how are vaccines going to be distributed? How sensitive are people to um, whatever cultural barriers may people people may have and not want to take them? How is it going to work within communities? How are you going to how are you going to go into a community that doesn't have what you need to keep these darn things cold and make yeah. sure that people? And is it going to at the end of the day? actually be something and who are you to tell us when we do and when we don't need a vaccine oh mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know right uh, <laughs> absolutely true you know like this is my my next goal is to you know get funding so we can educate our community on the benefits of the vaccine right you know for black people and indigenous people who have extreme or experienced extreme historical trauma at the hands of those in white coats why would we want a vaccine right like I didn't want vaccine. I wanted everybody else around me to get vaccinated and, and, and keep me safe. But, you know, I want, you know, that, that funding, right, to educate my community on the importance of, you know, why we need this vaccine and, uh, and how this is really a movement of equity and access, right? You know, the other communities, the Latinx community up here in Spokane, they created a, um, uh, what do I want to say? A, a medical clinic overnight, 
you know, had their website up and everything. Boom, they got the vaccine. They're vaccinating their people. The indigenous community, you know, they already had a very well organized uh, um, healthcare system. Boom, they have the vaccine. And, and, a, and a shout out to them as a sovereign nation, what they're doing Absolutely. The vaccine right now. You know, I don't want to say, because I don't know what's, but they're, they're taking care of their people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. But who's speaking for the black community now? Then, then that's what we gotta have to ask ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, where are our NAACPs? Where are you know um, our other people? How are we getting access to it? You know, mm -hmm. um, and and that's why we have to work collaboratively to advocate for our community, um, to educate, and you know, because I'm hearing everything from you know the vaccine has a chip in it. You know, I won't be able to get into heaven if I have it. Um, you know, to like, why would I accept it because of, you know, the harm and the injustices that have already been perpetuated on the black community? Is it effective? You know, what are the, um, the side effects of it? You know, um, was it tested on, you know, the black community or, you know, who was that base or um, the original people that they experimented with it on? Uh, there's a lot of questions, you know, and, and we deserve to be educated. Yeah. And, and from their perspective, for legitimate questions. Le these aren't, you know, whatever you're thinking about, well, why would anybody think that? Legitimate questions. If we can go back through history, too much time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Hey, these are why these questions uh, are being asked. Um, so again, uh, statewide, 24 people responded. Um, I was, uh, I just, if, if there's some of the, you know, just because there was a variety of folks and individuals and, um uh um that that came together for this um mm -hmm. uh, and you know i i guess what i'm saying is that just that itself was pretty cool if you want to talk about some of the yeah absolutely you off. know yeah i looked at people that i work with across the state you know who have platforms who are effective and um, have a great deal of expertise and in, in the advocacy arena who represent you know um not only communities of color, but, you know, individuals who have navigated many systems like the formerly incarcerated, like our peer base, you know, I, I am a, a peer, you know, I, because I've been incarcerated, I have taken the time, you know, to train myself on how I can work with um, the justice system and reforming it and also serve um, the people that are currently in the system. Uh, you know, the behavioral health community as well, because we know individuals who have, um, you know, mental illness or substance use disorders are often uh, categorized as, uh, you know, less than deserving. You know, um, I brought together communities that represent that and, and ultimately the faith-based community because, you know, historically in the black community, the faith-based community has been the hub of protection um, for our communities. Um, however, they still need that uh, that support and how um, they activate, you know, their parishioners. You know how um, how they activate themselves. You know, I mean, we're all going through this process of you know internal liberation because we've been so socialized into you know this colonization or white supremacy um, ideology, you know, that we have to be able to do the work ourselves internally to liberate ourselves. Um, and oftentimes that comes with great distress and discomfort um, or lack of ability or awareness that it is even needed to uh, happen, you know. Um, so yeah, it was the public school system, faith-based communities, um, peers, uh, you know, individuals that, um, you know, have a deeper understanding of the complexities of the systems and, and how challenging it can be to have a seat at the table, to get a seat at the table. We're good once we get there, but how do we get there, right? You know? And we got a meeting on Monday, uh, the disability meeting, yep. and then Tuesday, where we kind of reconvene again. And, yeah. and then, yeah. as you know, I'm telling. I'm sharing information. <laughs> <laughs> well, That's why I love you. You got to speak the truth. You're speaking the truth. That's what we need, right? Uh, my guest is, uh, guest is Carmen Pacheco Jones. I'm so glad that uh, 
uh, you know, I just wanted folks to get a chance to hear you and learn more about you uh, and know who you are. If they do not know, now you know. Um, and um, uh, just to quickly talk about the Dismantling Racism uh, series. And, and you can catch that across our platforms, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Twitch, um, in our archive. You can go to Rainier Avenue Radio. Uh, you can listen in our archive. Uh, Daniel, are those up yet? Yeah. Not the video is up. Okay. Um, and then we'll have the audio up as well. So just quickly, if you would, Carmen, talk about the Dismantling Racism series and the three parts that were uh, part of it. Absolutely. You know, that just came to me like in a moment of, you know, like, what can I do? You know, uh, this work that I'm doing is local, it's Spokane. Let's bring it to a, a broader platform. Reached out to Tony, reached out to um, subject matter experts across the state, um, individuals with lived experience and um, peers, people who have navigated the the justice system or, you know, systems that uh, potentially can be systems of harm, um, behavioral health, et cetera, you know, and um, really wanted to promote it out to the service provider community and to government and state agencies. Um, and we did get a broad representation from those communities who showed up. Um, so we wanted to talk about the disparate impact of um, these systems on, not only on communities of color, but all communities that otherwise are oppressed and marginalized. You know, um, the panelists spoke each about their experience of, um, you know, navigating the system, how they were able to overcome, and how now they have built up programs, um, grassroots organizations, or working with other organizations um, to support the community currently. I mean, we should all have that concept of when you know, if we are able to overcome, right? Like, how do we build that ripple effect? You know, for me, it is, you know, I navigated over, you know, several years of um, incarceration, you know, had to learn for myself because there was nobody out there telling me this is how you do it. And this is um, what works. You know, I had to figure out what it, how it works. I had to, you know, <laughs> get some windows and doors open, you know, and, and get at that table so it, I could start working on uh, reform efforts. Um, and, uh, the the whole basis of it is to disrupt those systems of power and when we look at the uh, nonprofit industrial complex we see that hierarchy of power right you know sometimes their outputs are 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 harmful um, right and and sometimes our people and again our people all marginalized oppressed historically um communities um you know are not getting access you know, they're getting funneled out of care as opposed to funneled into care. How do we go upstream and disrupt these, um, you know, harmful systems? And how do we build a just and thriving community for all? You know, that that's all I want. You know, it's that's what we want, right? You know, um, and we are so deserving of that. My guest again, Carmen Pacheco-Jones. Uh, again, uh, we did talk about the vaccine <laughs> and vaccine engagement. And um, uh, we're going to share more information about that. Uh, Carmen, we got a couple minutes left. Um, like I said, uh, I wanted to make sure that because we talk about the pandemic and uh, on this particular show, but this is a domino effect that, you know, that is, is it affects everything. Um, so there's a couple minutes left. We know what happened yesterday. Uh, I just want to give you a couple minutes to, to say whatever you want to say to our audience about whatever you want to talk about. Thank you. You know, I, I think that because we've been so traumatized and so silenced, you know, and because we live in cultures of, you know, stigma and stereotyping, you know, to create safe spaces, affinity um, spaces, where we are not beneath the white gaze, where we are openly discussing, you know, our collective trauma and strategically or tactically, um, you know, building um, up spaces where, you know, we have access to land, to housing, 
um, to equitable jobs that, you know, where we're not, you know, receiving 54 or 72 cents on the dollar um, as the white man is, you know, repairing those wage gaps, you know, creating and building, um, you know, systems of education that serve our communities and not harm our communities. Um, and it's so important to me, you know, as a mother, you know, I'm sitting here holding my grandson who's, um, my son took his life in August and, um, I don't want to see other parents suffer like that. You know, we deserve better, you know, and, and we demand better, you know, um, and we're, we're not rushing the capital um, steps because had that been, you know, Black Lives Matter or um, black and brown individuals, you would have seen a littering of bodies across the steps. You know, we can no longer stand for that inequity that our lives are diminished simply because of the color of our skin. That's about all I have right now. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing. And uh, again, my condolences to you. Thank you for the work you. that you continue to do. Um, uh, again, and we'll, you know, at, after Monday and Tuesday, we'll, we'll talk about what happened. We'll share people what happened. And, you know, remember, we can uh, we can bridge the, the ice and the snow don't make a difference. We got a, 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 a hotline to bridge that distance between Seattle and Spokane so we can keep each other informed. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Thank you. Share, share information. Um, and as a matter of fact, you know, you were talking about it. And uh, again, I want to tell everyone about the uh, mental health town hall uh, on Thursday. Uh, the 14th that's going to be taking place. I understand you deserve to be heard. You deserve to be understood. Uh, we know that it's not easy to, uh, in today's climate, with race and social upheaval and isolation, not to mention the very real mental health effects of historical and generational trauma. And these, you know, uh, to add on to that, it, you know, the difficulties in trying to find mental and physical health providers that understand what it is to be Black in America. It's hard to navigate that. So this Thursday, uh, King County Council Member Gurmai Zahilai uh, will be hosting, uh, put on by the National Alliance on Mental uh, Ill Illness Seattle. We'll be hosting. We're going to be putting on this live stream at 7 o'clock. Uh, panelists, mental health experts, um, join us. You can watch on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. You can call in at, at our 206-290-9685 number and ask questions. Um, and, uh, yeah, let's come together and support each other and, and let our voices be heard. So that's this Thursday, the 14th coming up from six to seven 30. And then I think at seven 30, we might actually have just a, a just a, a raw open Q and a session. Um, and you'll be hearing more about that. So stay tuned. Um, thank you, uh, again, Carmen for joining me. Thank you, Tony. Thank you for providing this platform. And I appreciate all the work that you're doing and uh, look forward to our continued work together. All right, we'll be, we'll be back to talk with the Seattle Department of Transportation right after this. Rainy Avenue Radio. The Urban League of Metropolitan Seattle, empowering communities and changing lives. The Urban League has been there to serve when our community is at its lowest. It's never mattered what the crisis was. The systemic oppression remains constant for those most vulnerable. Here at the Urban League of Metropolitan Seattle, we'll be temporarily adjusting our hours of operation and available services. If you are in need of resources, we recommend that you give us a call at 206-461-3792. To make an appointment, press zero and speak with the reception. Walk-in hours will be from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday through Friday. And hey, we'll gladly work with you via phone as best as we can if you're exhibiting any signs of illness to assist you with information to save your home, find you a place to sleep, or connect you to job opportunities. The Urban League of Metropolitan Seattle. That's 206-461-3792. Rainier Avenue Radio presents All Music All Day Saturday. Music All Day Saturday. 
Blues. This is Edwin Bailey, Bulldog Blues. Jazz from the Cabinets. That's right. It's time once again for Jazz from the Cabinets. The Big Poppy. Star Time. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Paul Pierce. This is Star Time. Saturdays, all music, all day. Reggae out. K Fox Night. Looking for the perfect beat? Yeah, it's the beat of the box. K-Fox Fresh night. juice with D Money in the group. Myself to the money. My size patrol. Taylor Hart. This is Spencia. The Northwest Rap Game. DJ Medina. Chad Cheddar. Northwest Rat Game. Sergio LaCour's Love Line. It's Sergio's Love Lines with Sergio LaCour. Go into the phone line. Tell her what we just Sea Monster Radio. Mo Jams is your jam. We're live. Welcome to Mo Jam Mondays. This is KZ of KZ Music Media. Holler Goddess. Holler Goddess for Mo Jam Mondays. For- just my opinion. God is inspiration. Music. All day and all night. Saturday. Rainier Avenue Radio. This is the news on Rainier Avenue Radio. A man in Colorado has become the first known U.S. case of the newly identified strain of COVID-19 circulating in the U.K., AP reports. The new variant is thought to be more contagious than other established variants and has prompted some countries to restrict travel from the U.K. Although the new variant has not been found in the U.S. until now, the CDC noted that it was probably already circulating through the country. The agency said while the new variant had not been identified through sequencing efforts, quote, labs have only 51,000 of the 17 million U.S. cases, and the variant might not have been picked up. Detection of this new variant in the U.S. comes as COVID-19 continues to spread seemingly unabated. There has been 19.5 million confirmed cases in the U.S. so far, and over 338,000 deaths, according to Johns Hopkins University data. And that's your news on Rainier Avenue Radio. Would you like to see when your favorite Rainier Avenue Radio show comes on? Check out our show schedule, updated weekly at RainierAvenueRadio.world. Welcome to RainierAvenueRadio.world. Somebody's trying to call me. <laughs> uh, it's me, Tony B. Um, this is the impacts of the coronavirus on South Seattle special. Our first one of the year. That is still odd to say, Daniel, the money. I mean, we started this on March 13th. Um, and now we're saying our first one of the year because we knew there were going to be more. We don't know how long this is going to go on, but we'll continue to be here. Uh, to share information with you, to share information from our community, through our community, by our community, from your community, to our community, from our community, to your community. Um, As Juan Cotto would say, your community radio station, my community radio station. (laughs) Um, I guess I should give a shout out to the Juan then, since I brought his name up. Juan does uh, our football, uh, uh, basketball, and uh, specializes for us uh, the lead in baseball play-by-play broadcast and um, yeah so we'll see if high school sports come back uh, right now we're on track for some sports and yes we will be broadcasting high school sports right here on Rainier Avenue radio uh, dot world and there may be some limitations on entry so um, yeah we, we're gonna have that for you we, we got you Uh, We just finished speaking with Carmen Pacheco Jones uh, about vaccination engagement through the state of Washington. Um, uh, Spoke earlier uh, again with uh, Violette Lavatai, executive director for the Tenure Union of Washington. Coming up a little bit later, we're going to talk to King County Council Chair Claudia Balducci and then the two billion dollars from Amazon for housing uh, in East King County right now. Uh, I'm going to be talking with a couple folks from the Seattle Department of Transportation. Um, Mr. Uh, Joel Miller. Joel, you here with me? I'm here. Thanks for having us, Tony. All right. And Sarah, is it calling or calling, Sarah? You got it right. Calling. Calling. You know, that that's something different now uh, with the way that we communicate each other. I think the easiest thing for me to do is just say, can you hear me? You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we get that out of the way, you know, because people forget to mute and unmute and then the internet goes on and all that stuff. And mm-hmm. okay, good to have uh, both both of you here. Um, Joel is the Seattle Department of Transportation Micro Mobility Program lead and runs the bike and scooter share permitting programs for the city and uh, is working to ensure that Seattle residents and visitors 
have plenty of clean, healthy, and equitable mobility options to get around. And uh, that's important. And again, you know the inspiration for this show, no matter what we talk about, is the impacts of the coronavirus. Um, and so uh, we're going to definitely talk about that. And, uh, you know, because unashamedly, we are Rainier Avenue Radio um, and uh, emanating from South Seattle, um, but broadcasting to the world. Uh, you know, and, and I'll say this again, a lot of times when people hear about South Seattle because of the diversity of our neighborhood, they think about crime, they think about, because that's usually what mainstream media gives us. And I'm not on a mainstream media rant. Uh, but the, when we talked earlier from the tenants union, the executive director was from Southeast Seattle. And we have another Southeast Seattle resident, Sarah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> another one of our community members. Uh, is the uh, a community outreach lead at the Seattle Department of Transportation. Yes, she lives in Rainier Valley, so she gets to experience the projects uh, that she works on, like the Rainier Avenue, Vision Zero, Route 7, Transit Plus, uh, Safe Routes to Schools, and more. We're going to be talking about this. Uh, Cheryl's been doing outreach for uh, more than eight years and started in social services at the YWCA, uh, Seattle and King County, received her master's in public health from the University of Washington's community oriented public health public health practice program. All right, South Seattle resident. You know, I got to big up our South Seattle, you know, residents. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, Joel, I started with you. So I'll, 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 let's talk about this. Um, the Micro Mobility Program League, that's a pretty big $25 title you got there. Um, <laughs> what, what what does that mean? What do you do? Let us know what you do. Yeah, yeah, Micro Mobility is one of those words that, um, when I type it in and, and I think it still gets that red underline saying I'm spelling something wrong, but it's really just uh, small mobility options that um, generally electric powered that, um, that, that are, are newer. And so instead of saying, Oh, that's, that's a bicycle over there. Oh, and that's a scooter over there. And that's a, that's a scooter with a seat. Oh, and that's something I haven't seen before. We're just uh, the industry, cities, uh, and folks are just kind of using this term micromobility to talk about bikes and scooters and a whole lot of other things right now. And so I'm managing those programs for the city of Seattle, um, the, the shared programs. And so what we do is we issue permits to some private operators to um, come to Seattle. And if they meet our permit conditions, that, that means they're meeting Seattle's goals, uh, they're, they're free to operate their business here. Okay. How long has this been in existence? Yeah, well, we started the this current model back in 2017 for bike share, um, and then scooters just came on the scene this past fall. All right, and um, I, I want to take you back. Did, how did the pandemic impact what what you do, your work, your job, the micro mobility program lead? How, what was the impact uh, on you when this happened? Obviously there's some impacts. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, there was, uh, we, we started 20, what year was that? 2020. I still need to check what on that. Year was that? <laughs> <laughs> we started 2020 kind of with a pretty clear path forward. We knew what we were going to do. We had, um, an operator, uh, operating up to 4,000 bikes in the city. Um, and the pandemic hit and they quickly kind of pivoted and we actually lost bike share back in the spring for a few months. It was frustrating because we had just worked on um, getting a program for essential workers. So this was jump bikes back in the spring um, and, and we were just kind of launching a program where essential workers could use these bikes for free and we, we, we'd um, station them in, in key areas around hospitals around the city and then, and then it all kind of went away. Um, but uh, we worked to bring them back in the summer, and then um, we worked with city council and the mayor's office to, to launch scooters in, in, um, in the fall. And uh, we see these as a great way for people to get around during COVID. You know, we don't see the same ridership numbers that you would see when people are traveling, uh, like, like before the pandemic. But, but the trips that are happening, um, we see it as a way that people can travel in the open air. So they're outside, they're not kind of in an enclosed space sharing. Um, you know, air like if you're in a car or Uber or Lyft or somebody. And um, and so it's giving you a kind of a, a clean, healthy way to get around that's not only um, more COVID friendly and safe, but also better for the environment and, and better for climate justice going forward. And so we want to offer that option to folks. 
And uh, are these available in every community, select communities, some communities? Yeah, they're available. Um, the, the program is available citywide. And then it's that kind of key question, where are the actual scooters and devices? Um, they are um, concentrated generally in the city center, but we do require that they are in the south end as well. So that's just one of those permit requirements that I was mentioning that, that meet the city's goals. And we say, um, if you want to come here, you have to make sure some of your devices are, are there. And so um, they're, they're, they are there. Um, Link has a lot of devices in the south end. That's one of the vendors. And Lime has some as well. And Wheels, the third uh, vendor that has this kind of seated style scooter, is, is showing up there as well. Um, so they are available. And um, there's a lot of great options for folks as well. So I do want to take a second to plug. Um, there's essential workers options for both Lime and Link. And that means... Um, if you work not only in healthcare, but as in the groceries and deliveries in, in, in any kind of those fields where you have to get out and work right now, um, you can use these devices for free. And so um, we have the information on how to sign oh, up well, for those. Hey, wait, hold up a minute. I think yeah. I just heard free dollars. Free uh, dollars. You did. Free dollars. Okay. Back up. Uh you know, because you said it. And so we're going to make sure that folks understand and hear what I'm talking about. Uh, when I say free. That's F-R-E-E. -E. Back yeah. up and say that again. Free. So um, if you're if you're an essential worker, you can access these for free. Um, you have to sign up via the, the company's websites, but we have those links on our website. So if you just search like Seattle Scooter Share, you'll get to our website and you'll see the, the links for either Lime or then I know it's super confusing, but the other company's name is Link. So I'm gonna say you link to Link and <laughs> it's painful for me, but I don't choose their names. Uh, <laughs> but uh, both of those companies have um, services so that if people kind of show that they work for, um, you know, whether it's a grocery or healthcare or something like that, then they can access free service. Um, but even for folks that don't, Tony, um, and they, if you are lower income, so say you qualify for Orca Lift or SNAP benefits or public housing benefits, um, you can also get really, really heavily reduced fares. Um, and that's like your average, maybe 15 minute trip might just cost 10 cents or something like that. So it, it's really um, heavily reduced fares. And those are also, uh, um, requirements that we have in the permit that we say, hey, if you come here and operate, you have to, to make it affordable for people that might not be able to afford this. So we're not just offering kind of a mobility option for people that, uh, that you know, work in tech and make six figures. It, it's, it's really trying to make it for, for everybody in the city. And so um, those instructions on how to sign up are also on our website. Okay. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit about how these things work because people probably see them and go, oh, well, that's cool. Uh, I, maybe I, or uh, I, I should, or nah, I don't know how it works. You know? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. I mean, you'll see them, you know, they're, they're often staged by the light rail stations. Um, and uh, you, you first need to sign up for uh, the apps on the phone. So you can get on the internet. And again, if you go to our website, you'll see how to sign up. But um, you, you sign up for the apps. And if, um, if you're signing up for a low income plan, there's ways that you can do this without having access to a credit card or access to a smartphone and data. And so the, there's kind of instructions on how to do that. But really say you're using your phone, you just use your phone, you scan the little QR code on the device and um, you'll have to kind of do some steps. Um, if it's your first time, you'll need to put in payment options if you're if you're not signed up for the, the free or low income plans. And then, um, and then you just start the ride. Uh, right now we're asking that users take a quick quiz just so that they know how to ride safely, how to park correctly, because this is a new thing. Um, and then you, you, you take that scooter or bike, um, you ride it pretty much like a bike um, to your destination. And then we're just asking you to park it responsibly. So don't park it in the middle of the sidewalk or the middle of a curb ramp or blocking a bus stop. Um, park it in that that space that's kind of where you'll see garbage cans and things like that. It's the parking strip or the furniture zone. Um, and and then you can be on your way. You just uh, end your trip and um, and that's it. So it's really pretty simple. All right. Uh, Joel, I'm going to get to Sarah. Uh, Sarah, 
uh, Southeast Seattle community member. Let's talk about what you do as community outreach lead at the Seattle Department of Transportation. It sounds kind of self-explanatory, like, well, community outreach. But, but what, what, what does that mean? What, what do you do? What is your role? Sure. Um, so I am assigned to projects um, largely in South Seattle. And what I do is I um, do my best to make sure that neighbors are aware of projects and can give their input so that we're building projects that work for neighbors. Okay. And so what that means is, um, you know, pre-COVID, we would do open houses. Um, we try and have a variety of ways that people can engage. We do surveys, we go door to door, we hold small group meetings, meet with community groups, do things like this, um, <laughs> for example. Mm -hmm. And um, how did COVID impact, you know, your role as a community outreach person, obviously, uh, everything got shut down. You can't host mm -hmm. meetings. You can't, you know what I mean, have gatherings, share information. How did this change the way that you do what you do? Uh, I'll start with that. How did, how did this mm -hmm. change the way that you do what you do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the most obvious way is um, we couldn't gather in spaces with people anymore. And so that was a big change because that was a big way that we would get the word out to people about projects and get people's input. Um, we were able, luckily technology, we were able to pivot um, to, and a lot of times you can reach a broader population anyway when um, you're not expecting people to come to the place that you're at. So we found that community, a lot of community groups were still meeting. And so we would ask to um, join those meetings if people want us to be there um, so that we can talk with people to, directly and I mean, virtual meetings. Um, and we were still able to do some door to door if necessary, wearing masks. Um, and we are always trying to share ideas with each other of creative ways to reach people, especially because um, with so much going on, transportation just might not be top of mind for a lot of people as well. And, and and how has that been? If you don't know, you know, we have open, honest, frank conversation here on this radio station. Has, has that been effective? Have you been hampered? If as a member of the community, uh, would you say that the community is informed about things that are taking place? Again, just whatever it is, it is. Right. Um, you know, I can um, never claim that um, everyone is informed or engaged, but I do, uh, I, I feel like my biggest outreach effort um, over the last year was around Rainier Avenue South. Um, and I don't know if you um, noticed this, but we changed the lane configuration between Rainier Beach and Hillman City. Yeah, we watched, we watched it. <laughs> we watched it gradually happen. Yeah. Uh-huh. And so um, to get the word out about that, we um, did a mailer um, to to reach at least every address in the area. We did media like South Seattle Emerald um, and emails and then individual calls um, and posters, et cetera along the project area. So I think that um, we, um, you know, tried <laughs> to make sure that people were well aware. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of competing information out there. And so um, I'm, I'm sure that <laughs> people could have still been surprised by that change. Yeah. So you got to do better. You know what I'm saying? Um, you got to do better at it. I'm not saying it's not tough because of COVID, but, um, you know, people get tired of, and I'm not just, I'm just saying, you know what it is really people get tired of running into changes. How did this happen? Whoa, when did this happen? Why did this happen? Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm listening and I'm hearing you and I'm thinking that, you know, there needs to be more done, uh, in order, uh, for our community to be aware of when changes are happening, you know, uh, and why they are happening not just that they're happening. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm, we're, we are here to help you get the word out. <laughs> right. uh, but just, I'm just saying, you know, we, we, 
we can do better than that. We can mm -hmm. do better than that. I see you raising your hand, Joel. I'm not talking to you right now. Um, so uh, let's hear about some of these projects that are that are going on um, right now in in uh, while we have folks listening uh, that are going on right now and that may be coming up in the future. Yeah, and I I absolutely hear you. Um, and uh, you're right. We should have been on this radio program before the changes went in, and that's absolutely a lesson learned. Um, but now at least I can talk about the why because um, that could be a question for people. So we, um, as part of our Vision Zero goal, which is to eliminate traffic deaths and serious injuries in the city by 2030, um, we need to focus on Rainier Avenue South. Um, Rainier, you know, as you know, has great destinations. Um, this radio station <laughs> was one, but I know you recently moved. Um, but you know, there's also community centers, grocery stores, lots of small businesses. Um, I like you can get, you get to anywhere in Seattle from Rainier Avenue, one way or another. <laughs> I know, <laughs> exactly. And it needs to be safer. There's too many collisions out there, um, too many people getting hurt. And so as part of Vision Zero, we made some bold changes um, a few years ago in Columbia City. And based on that, we saw some some really good safety improvements and heard really good feedback um, from neighbors about that change. And so we extended that further south to Rainier Beach. Um, and so what that is, is we put in bus lanes and a center turn lane. Um, so we're keeping the, the seven moving. Um, the center turn lane helps people get into businesses. It also makes left turns um, a lot safer and easier. Um, and we made a lot of improvements for pedestrians so, um, for example, at Rainier Rose, um, we made it a lot easier to cross at that intersection right by the Ethiopian Community Center um, and by the um, Southeast Seattle Senior Center. We um, made it so that um, people have a lot more time to cross at that location. And we also put in, extended the curb right there to make the crossing shorter. So um, things like that, among many other things um, in this area, are, are ways that we're incrementally working to make Rainier safer. And what goes into the decision process of, OK, we think this will be safer as opposed to this will make traffic flow. I, I'm assuming you're going to say you have community meetings, but ultimately, you know, how and why are these decisions made? And you did mention some areas that were problem areas. Mm hmm. Yeah, so that first phase in Columbia City was a, a pilot and it was a way uh, for us to do a short segment and see how it worked and see what neighbors thought about it. And so because that improved um, safety so significantly and neighbors really um, gave us feedback that it was a way for people to travel to destinations on Rainier rather than traveling through Rainier. Um, and so based on that, we um, started talking to people um, who live and work further south um, about extending it. And we did work with um, Department of Neighborhoods to um, work with community liaisons so that, you know, we weren't um, talking to like only um, people who are already engaged, um, but also like going to um, housing developments going to the senior center um, and, you know, standing outside of Safeway to catch people who are walking in to to get their thoughts on what they wanted the street to look like. Hmm. Uh, you know what? And we're almost out of time here. Um, uh, and thank you, Sarah, by the way. Joel, I know you raised your hand and you're patient. <laughs> I wanted to make sure that I had some time to get back to you. I apologize. I was waving. I, I have a window behind me and I was waving to the mailman. I didn't think you could oh. see me, Tony. <laughs> either, either way, I want to give you an opportunity for final words. Before yeah, we well, I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate um, you uh, taking the time to have us on. I think this, this is really helpful for, for the whole department to talk about these issues. Um, I, I just want to to again, get the word out there on these low income programs and the essential worker programs for micro mobilities for bike share and scooter share. Just Google um, 
scooter, Seattle scooter share, anything like that. You should see the department's webpage and it will have the links that you need. And then I'm also looking for feedback on ways we can make this work better for people. And so you can email me directly, joel.miller at seattle.gov. And um, I'll see that and, and we can see how we can make bike and scooter share work for the people um, down on Rainier Ave um, better uh, this year, next year, and going forward in the future. All right, we'll make that happen. And Sarah, again, uh, uh, opportunity for you for final words, anything that you want to say uh, to our communities. Mm -hmm. um, I heard you say earlier when you were talking with Carmen that uh, everything's a domino effect. And I uh, agree with that, that everything connects. And so um, I really appreciate uh, your program and that, um, you're uh, drawing these connections, you know, between transportation and COVID and race um, and outreach and how uh, engage engagement um, affects people. So thank you. Uh, thank you for having us. All right. Um, we'll, we'll make sure we uh, get some, well, you know, Sarah, for, for, can people still give feedback? Is there, or, or, or Joel, uh, is there a, a, a one, place you can give me where people can go if they have questions or, or, or feedback or something like that? Um, I uh, have an email at least for the Rainier Project and also a phone number for the Rainier Project. And then Joel might have a separate one for <laughs> Scooter okay. Share. Otherwise, it would have to be our general SDOT line, um, which is the DOT road. You give me what you want people to have who are saying, I want to hear more about this or find out about this. Give You tell me what they should do. Both of you, I guess, in case they're separate. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I think I think the general city line is, is best. Those folks in customer service do a great job of, of routing things to, to me, to Sarah, to, to where it needs to go. So that's uh, 684 road. So you can call 684 ROAD or it's 684 road at seattle.gov. Um, I think that that works. Again, if people want to email me directly, it's joel.miller at seattle.gov taking feedback on the bike and scooter share program. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, thank both of you for coming uh, on the show. Coming up next, we've got King County Council Chair Claudia Balducci. We're going to talk about the $2 billion uh, Amazon is giving for housing uh, in East King County right after this. This is Paul Pearson, host of Star Time. And when I'm not being reprimanded by traffic cops, I'm listening to Rainier Avenue Radio World. <laughs> The coronavirus is real. Let's be diligent about washing our hands. Did you know that this virus can live on surfaces for up to nine days? That's why it's also important to disinfect things that an infected person might touch, like your cell phone. Even if you wash your hands often, when you pull out your phone, those germs go right back on your hands. When's the last time that you cleaned your phone? When the virus is spread by sneezing or coughing, those tiny airborne droplets eventually land on surfaces that you touch with your hands. On average, we touch our face 16 times an hour, which is why it's important to wash your hands and wipe down commonly used surfaces, including your cell phone. This message is a public service of RainierAvenueRadio.world. What kind of nonsense conversation are we having here? The Neon Ghost Show. The Neon Ghost Show. Right here on Rainier... At, wait, what's it? Rainier Avenue Radio dot world. Right about now. Rainier Avenue Radio dot world. I'm so tired. I have to... <laughs> <laughs> Wash your hands, don't touch your face Wipe things down, clean up your space When you cough and sneeze, do responsibly If you feel you're getting ill, 
isolate at home and chill. No, you're not alone. Please pick up your phone and call 206-477-3977. King County 206-477-3977. Public Health 206-477-3977. King County 206-477-3977. Public Community Radio Station will provide you with more information. Say Rainier Avenue Radio. Your community radio station will provide you with more information. Rainier Avenue Radio. You are listening to Rainier Avenue Radio. World. Don't forget to log on www.rainieravenueradio. World. Welcome back to Rainier Avenue Radio dot world. It's me, Tony B. This is uh, our special broadcast of the impacts of the coronavirus on South Seattle and surrounding communities. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, it's our first one of the year, uh, which again is just uh, the the reality of saying that, knowing that this is going to go on for a while, and then thinking back that we started doing these broadcasts on March 13th, um, and uh, the need continues, the need grows, the number of areas that are impacted, and when I say areas, I mean areas of life, along with geographical areas, uh, by the pandemic, um, just uh, continues to uh, impact the lives of, of everybody in different ways. Um, earlier on in the show, uh, we had our guest from the uh, Violetta, Violet uh, from the Washington State Tenants Union and Carmen Pacheco Jones from Spokane, uh, again, pulling together folks uh, uh, with the uh, Department of Health uh, and folks from all over the community to share information about vaccine engagement and how that's going to work, what that's going to look like, providing input, feedback. Just spoke with uh, our guest from Sia, uh, the Seattle Department of Transportation, uh, Joel Miller and Sarah Calling, hyper-focused in on what's going on in South Seattle. But this is surrounding communities. And if you if you live 15 minutes away from a community, uh, whatever's going on in, in the community 15 minutes away is going to impact you the same way if it's not already. So there is a connection there. Um, uh, I have uh, on the show with me King County Council Member Claudia Balducci. Claudia, how are you? Very good. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, uh, thanks for having me. Well, Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you as well, Council Member um, Balducci. And, and thank you for uh, coming on the show recently. Um, uh, wow. $2 billion investment in housing. Yeah. Two billion. Let wow! Two billion dollar investment in housing um, uh, from Amazon. And uh, again, as I mentioned, you know, all, all of our communities are facing trauma uh, during this time. Um, uh, so let's go. Let's go. How did this happen? Let's huh. talk about it uh, from Amazon. Yeah. Uh, well, it's it's great news. It, it was a surprise. Uh, this was not something that we saw coming. It was a, it was a very nice surprise announcement for uh, just a couple of days ago. But it's been a long time coming. So, uh, so this, this is this is not something you had been lobbying for, or uh, or twisting arms for, or <laughs> there have uh, been lots of conversations behind the scenes. But it, you may recall a few year ago, two years ago, Microsoft announced a large investment in affordable housing. I believe theirs was on the order of about five hundred million dollars. And they have been looking for partners to join them. And Amazon has obviously stepped up now in a big way. So, so companies and employers have been looking at this. But, you know, the, these employers and our, and our region has been growing tremendously for decades now. And we have not been keeping up with the no amount of housing we need for all these new jobs. So people move in, they make good wages, the cost of housing go up and up and up and up. And folks who can't afford to live near the major employment centers get pushed further and further and further out. And so it's been a problem for a long time, and it's just really nice to see our major employers stepping up to help. Uh, it uh, it definitely will make a difference. Let's talk about District Six. Describe for us District Six, where it is, who lives there, geographically, what all that. 
You bet. District 6 of King County, which I represent, is the east side. Uh, it includes all or parts of 10 cities, Mercer Island, Bellevue, Kirkland, Redmond, all the points communities, a uh, little bitty part of Bothell, and the Sammamish Valley. So it's this long district, uh, mostly on the east side of Lake Washington in King County. And, and who are the residents that that live there, um, th that live in your county? How huh? you know what you know what, whether that be uh, ethnically, culturally, socially, um, who lives there? We've got quite a diversity. We've got uh, uh, all kinds of people from all walks of life, from some of the richest people in the world. Bill Gates lives here in District Six, uh, but we also have a very diverse population. A lot of immigrants from all over the world are, are I, I can never remember the number, but at last count in our public schools, uh, they speak more than well over 50 languages. There are, there are pockets uh, of, of need and poverty. There are people who, you know, work just regular working jobs and struggle to afford the important, you know, the very expensive uh, quality, cost of living here. And, and then there are people who do very, very well. And so it's it's a broad uh, a broad spectrum in East King County. And what what would you say uh, are some of the challenges? Uh, you know, I'm assuming that that's one of the reasons why you ran for office and, and some of the successes uh, yeah. uh, of East King County. Um, yeah. Sure. Well, I started out uh, on the Bellevue City Council. I served there for 12 years, including one term as mayor before I ran for King County Council. And uh, I live in East Bellevue. So if you're familiar with Lake Hills or Crossroads, uh, it is a place where a lot of the diversity and a lot of the economic diversity resides in East King County. And I think people think of downtown Bellevue, downtown Kirkland, is really very beautiful places, very expensive places, but there's, you know, there's working class East King County as well. And uh, and my fear has been over the years that as, as this community succeeds, as we get more jobs and uh, more growth, that we would go from being an expensive community to being an exclusive community where uh, we would run out people who weren't very wealthy. And, uh, and unfortunately, the numbers do bear that out, that the, the average income has been going up, the average level of educational attainment has been going up, and the average cost of homes are up over a million dollars now on average. So, uh, so we've done very well. I mean, we have Microsoft and Amazon is building here. Great. We've got Google. We've got uh, all kinds of smaller tech companies, aerospace companies. We've got great schools, some of the best schools in the country. Public schools are right here in East King County. It's an amazing place to live and build a family. We need some to do some work to make sure that that opportunity is open to everyone because increasingly it's harder to achieve. And we, we like to talk about how we're more diverse than Seattle, but we're more diverse in certain ways, right? Like we have quite a number of people who have moved here from Asia, from South Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, these are largely people who have good jobs or who are well to do. And so we, we don't have as many people who are struggling. We were historically a place that had uh, redlining here and uh, therefore didn't have a lot of diversity, didn't have a lot of black people who lived here and still don't. And that's not okay. We should be open to everybody. And so uh, I'm really proud of the fact that we're expanding light rail. It's going to open in two short years, fingers crossed, here to the east side. We've got great new housing and new jobs around the light rail. I want to make sure that we're making those opportunities open to everybody. And that's why I, I work hard at trying to develop affordable housing projects for people and also just make sure we have enough housing for people. My guest again is King County Council Member Claudia Balducci, District 6. Uh, you're listening to Rainier Avenue Radio uh, and our impacts of the coronavirus on South Seattle and surrounding communities. What, what has been the impact of the coronavirus uh, on the way that you do what you do and on, on the communities that you are elected to serve? So I imagine that is pretty similar for everybody in King County that um, it upended our lives, the coronavirus. Uh, the first outbreak in the United States was here in District 6. It was in Kirkland at uh, a long-term care facility called Life Care Center. 
And they, you may they, were, they were calling us the epicenter. The epicenter, and it was right here. Yeah, uh, yeah. it was. Uh, they they were. It was very scary at first. Uh, you know, a lot of people got sick. Quite a few people died. There was uh, Evergreen Hospital was very heavily pressured. A lot. Some of the healthcare providers there got very sick, and so we quickly went to. Those who could were sent home to work. I've been working here in my kitchen. You can see if you're, if you're watching the video. And, um, uh, but a lot of people couldn't. And so they have to continue going to work and wear masks and, and try to practice social distancing. We've seen a lot of uh, smaller businesses close down. A lot of our so like restaurants and hospitality, those, those industries were hit very hard. A lot of people who have lost their jobs. Uh, in King County, we had over a hundred thousand people apply for unemployment. And so it's it's been hard times for people. It's scary because of the disease and we're trying to keep people safe, but also people need to be able to support themselves. So uh, at King County, that meant that we started holding our meetings from, uh, from home and we still have to have uh, online meetings where members of the public can watch what we do as the representatives of the public and they can call in talk to us, testify, and still have an impact on our, our decisions. We continue to work all day in this way, uh, but we've been taking, an all, we, we've, we've set up a number of grant programs using CARES Act funding to try to help small businesses, to help people. We put quite a bit of money into healthcare and keeping people safe. We've stood up um, what they call isolation, quarantine, uh, and recovery sites, and de-intensification sites, so people who don't have a place to be but need to be uh, isolating themselves due to being exposed or being sick have a place to go. Uh, you've probably heard about our, our homeless shelter de-intensification sites where we can't have people just on mats in big, uh, big open spaces uh, during COVID, so we've uh, stood up some hotels where people can have a room to themselves, and that's worked out reasonably well. There's been some some challenges, but it's really helped to keep people who don't have homes uh, healthier. Uh, we've put a lot of money into rental assistance. We know that there's a rental uh, challenge with people who are falling behind on their rent because they can't afford to pay right now. That's something we're going to be working with our partners in the legislature on coming up because when the rental moratorium, the eviction moratorium expires, people are gonna need help to be able to pay the backlog and stay in their homes. So much to do. I could go on. I'm gonna pause there. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, again, uh, council member, King County Council member, Claudia Balducci, District 6. Um, okay, so Amazon pledges $2 billion for housing. Um, uh, Kind of, I'm to some extent caught y'all off guard. I'm like, wow, okay, this, this. I thought this was something that had, you know, been. So you get two billion dollars now. So what? What's 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 next? What's yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I'm, how's this gonna work? You know, I, I, I'm sure it hasn't been that many days, but, but how's this gonna work? You know, that's the the big question that people who live in that area that who are thinking about living in that area that like, whoa, wait, huh, what? <laughs> well, to be clear, uh, the $2 billion is for three different communities. One is in the Puget Sound area, mm -hmm. and they're also focusing their investments on other parts of the country where they have uh, a, a strong employment force, including in the Arlington, Virginia area, and I believe the other one is in Nashville. Um, so, so they get spread around. Okay. And the first uh, that's, that's good that's good to know because it just says two billion yeah and, you know okay so it's not all you don't have all of that it's not all coming here right and the first the first uh, actual investments they've announced are 185 million dollars uh, in loans and grants that will go to the King County Housing Authority that's a provider here that uh, provides affordable housing throughout King County but they're going to use it to buy up three particular apartment complexes that are currently what you would consider somewhat affordable. They have rents that people could have, you know, that are not um, like luxury rents and they're going to buy them so that they can stay that way. So it's preserving affordable housing. Mainly it's about keeping people from being thrown out of their homes. We've, we've seen that a lot here. A lot of folks displaced when the current owners sell and the new owners want to build luxury condos and everybody who lives there suddenly has to up and move. 
So the first uh, thing you'll see is about a thousand units, about a thousand homes will be preserved and re remain affordable. But we need to go beyond that, right? That's just patching the hole in the bottom of the bucket. The water, there's still not enough water in it, right? So I'm hoping that we can work with uh, Amazon and this generous investment, Microsoft and others, and the government, because we have our role to play too. It can't all be government, you know, private sector largesse uh, that, that gets us through this problem to create new housing opportunities, not just preservation. We need to do both. And let me say this, just to put it in context, let's say out of that 2 billion that we see an investment of six or 700 million, that is a huge number. At the King County Affordable Housing Committee, we did a study of how many homes we really need to have a healthy housing market, which means essentially nobody's cost burdened. You can afford with a reasonable, uh, even a, a reasonable low income, you can afford to pay rent, you can afford to pay mortgage. Um, we would need in the next four years about 44,000 units, 44,000 homes. Uh, by 2040, we would need 244,000 homes. This amount of money will pay for about a thousand homes, the, the, the first investment. Uh, we need a lot more work and we need, we need cities to step up and allow builders to build more housing. We need to work on displacement, anti-displacement strategies because, I mean, I'm talking in general terms here, but all of these impacts fall harder on communities of color and people of color than they do on uh, the majority, majority groups. And so we have a lot of work to do. I'm very grateful and very excited by this news, but I don't want people to think that that's done now. It's a piece and it's a nice piece, but we still have an awful lot to do to make sure that people can be stable in their homes in King well, County. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in the devil in those details for a second here. Let's do it. When, when you get, you know, an amount of money like that from a, a private, you know, business, uh, and then you talk about, I'm just saying, people go, government starting to run stuff you know and and purchase property um uh do you have a mechanism in place you know it, for that so that you could you can do this seamlessly cleanly um what this might look like how that works um because if you're talking about purchasing property you know uh, again that's a whole nother deal that's real estate you know and um do you do you have some sort of public development authority or something that is is there to make this transition happen smoothly, or is this something that you have to create along the way uh, in order to you know to ultimately, like you said, if you want to have more houses, you got to have a mechanism for making that happen. That's right, and that's a that is a great question. Uh, King County and you know most cities we don't own and and develop housing ourselves, but there are governmental agencies that do. King County Housing Authority that's working with this Amazon money is the biggest one here in King County, but Seattle has a housing authority. Renton has a housing authority. And there are a large number of nonprofit companies that um, that also own and develop and, and run housing for people. Uh, you might know of Pioneer Housing or Bellwether. On the east side, we have Imagine Housing. There's a whole, there's a whole ecosystem of these uh, companies. What I would love to see more of, and we have a little bit of this in some parts of the county, is community trusts, where you can have a community that owns the land, owns their own housing, and runs it for themselves. I think that's a really empowering way of providing housing, keeping a community together, and it can be a powerful anti-displacement strategy. And so you, you, is that something you're, you're working on? You're trying to figure out right now? Again, I know you said you just got it. Um, you, what, what's on the table? Is everything open for discussion? I mean, that sounds great. That's it, Is it something that, you know, that, well, it's not there yet? Sounds like a good idea. Um, how is it, you know, have you defined yet how what this is going to look like and, and how it's going to work? Or, I mean, it's nice to have the money. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think there's a reason why you see the first investments are through a very established organization like King County Housing Authority, because they can very quickly, they do this for a living, they do it all the time. They've got thousands of units already that they own and operate all over King County. Uh, it's very easy for them to identify properties that are good, 
to preserve, buy them and run them. That is the quickest thing you can do when it comes to providing more affordable housing. And so you, so it's not surprising to me to see Amazon decide that their first investments here in King County would be through the King County Housing Authority. How they develop the rest of their plan, I think is still up in the air. Uh, it's They have their own housing fund now that they've just established. Uh, I'm certainly gonna be reaching out to them. I know others will as well with ideas. Uh, I would love to carry any ideas that people have to them but I'm hoping that they will focus also on not just preserving, but creating new housing. And you can do that through all those agencies I just said. We don't have to, we don't have to start from zero. This, this plane is built and it's ready to fly. Uh, it just needs some gasoline, if I can torture the analogy. Um, it's, there's plenty of, of expertise and know-how and ability to build and run good housing for people and the money will help to do that. I just, you need to connect these things together. It's more of a connecting challenge and a resource challenge than, than we're not creating this wheel. This wheel exists. My guest again is King County Council Member Claudia Balducci. Uh, formerly, you were the uh, led the region's affordable housing task force. Is that right? That's, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that sunset. And now I'm the chair of the affordable housing committie. Yeah. And uh, we're talking <laughs> about uh, two billion, which isn't all going to, but maybe 500, 600, 700 million will go uh, to East King County. And uh, we hear about 185 million that that's kicking this thing off, and that's still a lot of money left. It sounds like uh, Council Member uh, Balducci, to quote John Lewis, you could be in store for some good trouble. <laughs> I would, and let me start by saying this: I represent East King County. I sincerely hope all of these investments do not all go to East King County. Uh, we have need for investments in South King County and North King County as well. And, and I, I would love to see a, an equitable spread of resources so that people can choose. So people have options to live near where they want to live. Uh, that's ultimately what we're about trying to do with housing. Okay. So uh, again, it says East King County. It does. <laughs> um, but I, uh, again, you know, I'm just asking. So, but that doesn't necessarily, that's, that's not where all the money has to be spent. Is that what I'm hearing you say? This is, this is Amazon's plan and it's Amazon's money and they'll decide what they're going to do with it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that they are working with organizations like the King County Housing Authority who do business all over King County. My hope would be that Amazon will choose to spread the investment around King County uh, and join in uh, investments that the government is making and others are making already to try to make it possible for people to choose to live in the communities that work for them and that are near their jobs, their schools, the places they want to be. So um, I guess I'm making a pitch to them through your radio show right here, right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, cool, cool in the gang. And, you know, because some people want to live in Seattle because of the proximity to downtown Seattle, I'm sure there are folks out here who go, well, you know, well, I want to live in East King County because of the things that you were talking about before. And this would also provide them an opportunity uh, to do that. Council member. Uh, Balducci, first of all, thank you for coming on in such a short notice. This went out. Uh, we got put the call out and you said yes, uh, <laughs> coming on and talking with us about this. Um, I want to give you a couple minutes here uh, before we you know, finish this, just to say whatever you want to say to your, your constituents, to folks in other communities uh, about anything that you want to say. The mic is yours. Well, thank you for the opportunity. First of all, thank you so much for inviting us to talk about this. Um, I know your, your show is billed as uh, speaking about the coronavirus, and I hope this isn't, uh, isn't duplicative, but the thing that I would want to say to people is uh, there's some light at the end of the tunnel. One of the things King County does is we provide the public health uh, services for, for King County and Seattle, and we know that it's been hard. We know that people are tired of staying home tired of wearing masks, uh, wondering when things will be able to get better. And the vaccines that are coming are providing a lot of hope. Um, and so I wanna encourage everybody to learn whatever they can about how to get vaccinated when the time comes, when our turn comes. I'm not at the top of the list. Uh, I think no, many of us are not. Um, and make sure that you stay safe, please. Uh, please continue to observe social distancing, please continue to wear masks and be healthy. We all wanna get through this. We wanna be here this time next year 
on the other side of COVID together. And so I just really like to take any opportunity to encourage people, get educated, learn what you can. Uh, vaccines are coming, but slowly they'll get here. Just today we announced two uh, mass vaccination locations will be stood up in South King County and some mobile vans. There'll be more information coming about that. We'll certainly be putting it out from King County over the next few days and weeks. Uh, and please, as we get to the end of this, please stay safe. All right, Council Member Balducci, uh, know that you always have a, uh, a voice here on uh, Rainier Avenue Radio. You know, whatever it is, we, we don't judge it. We just say if it's in our community, we reflect it. So um, whatever it is, you got, you got a place here to talk about it. Um, uh, now, uh, you also have a fellow council member, um, uh, King County Council Member Gurmai Zahilai. Uh, he will be hosting uh, an event next Thursday right here on the radio station. Um, it's a, uh, uh, a mental health town hall meeting with the National Alliance for Mental Health and Mental Illness. Uh, that's going to be Thursday, uh, and that'll be from 6 to 7.30 right here on Rainier Avenue Radio. Uh, there'll be a number of guests and panelists who'll be talking and discussing about the racial, historical, and generational traumas that are combined with the uh, tumultuous times and the impact that this is having on mental health in particular um, for black people. And so uh, I know that black people live in East King County too. And they may be experiencing a trauma, and this is an opportunity for them to be connected with other folks um, right. who are experiencing the same trauma, and just to share the information, um, um, you know, to everybody. Um, so again, that's uh, next Thursday, uh, January fourteenth, from six to seven thirty, uh, broadcast right here on Rainier Avenue Radio. You can hear it through all of our platforms: Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, uh, our app. Um, uh, the tune in app, you can just say uh, to Alexa, play Rainier Avenue radio. Uh, <laughs> you can log on to our website. So there's a number of ways for you uh, to hear that's next Thursday from six to seven 30. And then, um, don't forget, uh, coming up, um, the 39th annual Martin Luther King day celebration. Um, uh, 39th, we will be broadcasting live starting Sunday uh, from 2 to 4. Uh, we'll be showing you something put together by the Youth Committee. It's a short film of high school age students sharing about their activism and their views. That'll be from 2 to 4 on the 17th. We'll also be interviewing the producer director, uh, who, by the way, are, are teens. I think they're high school seniors, actually, or, or maybe one year out of high school. Uh, so we'll be debuting that film right here on Rainier Avenue Radio, 2 to 4 on Sunday. Sunday the 17th. And of course, on the 18th, Monday, Dr. King's holiday will be at the 39th annual MLK Day. Good trouble, necessary trouble, rally and march broadcasting live. The rally starts at uh, 11 o'clock. It's not going to be in the gymnasium this year. It's going to be outdoors um, right there in the parking lot area across from Zell's kind of. Uh, and there'll be social distancing distancing requirements. We'll be obviously giving you more information on that. And then we're also going to do the march as well. Uh, so if you can't get out or, you know, whatever the situation is, you can catch it right here on Rainier Avenue Radio dot world. Uh, the youth event uh, two to four, which is a film um, uh, about uh, youth talking about their activism and their views. And then the rally one of the oldest and largest in the country. You know, it, it really truly is uh, uh, an event to behold. And uh, if you can't make it there, you can watch it on Rainier Avenue Radio dot world. That's it. That's all the time that I have. That's going to do it for the kid. It's me, Tony B, saying, remember, whether you believe you can or whether you believe you can't, you are probably right.